And it gives me great pleasure to welcome Ramon to the stage. I've been very fortunate to listen to Ramon on a number of occasions. He, uh, you head up the King's College uh, Master's course. He has the most amazing uh, facility for training, phantom heads and so on. And Ramon, if I'm going to give you the stage you on pre-restored treatment of aligning for treatment. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, um, and I would like to thank the board for inviting me. So, my education was from uh, Denmark. I was trained with uh, Birte Milsen, um, and having an understanding of biomechanics from, from Birte has made me have a, a love for Invisalign. And then my journey has changed since I have been work, working um, in private practice. I have been working a lot with restorative dentists, and I've been learning or relearning occlusion again from, from a restorative perspective. So now I'm trying to combine uh, these things I'm learning because I am on my own professional journey as well. So to start, we need to define aesthetic dentistry if we are going to talk about pre-restorative orthodontics. I like this definition from a Canadian group. They talk about aesthetic dentistry incorporating biological considerations, ideal function, natural dentition, long-term performance. So if we keep this definition in mind, aesthetic dentistry is interdisciplinary. It's going to have orthodontics, it will have a restorative component, and also periodontics. And as Dr. Werner has also pointed out, the key, what is common to all of these is actually functional occlusion. That is what makes these things or work. If that is not there, it will fail. So, we will look at pre-restorative orthodontics in the concept of interdisciplinary dentistry. Case one is more of a story. So, we will talk about minimally invasive smile design. And I think one of the biggest problems in our profession is we have a lot of superheroes. We have many super orthodontists, many super dentists, and sometimes there is a communication breakdown. Um, because they both think they are right. I think we are all, uh, we can all hold our hand up to be in that situation. So in a case like this, the patient had seen the restorative dentist and they had did, I did a mock-up, a little build-up of this filling to see how it would look. The patient didn't like it. She goes, it was too wide. So the dentist sent the patient to me and said, Ramon, close the space, nothing else, just want this space closed. Okay. I can do that. I will need to IPR a little in the lower because I need to maintain my current overjet. Um, but I wasn't happy. I was looking at this and saying, well, you know, I can do so much more. We can add a little bit of talk to the upper left too. We can still play around with mesodistal widths. And the dentist said, Raman, that's all I need. So when you're in this predicament, you need to start sharing the vision of your restorative dentist. You have to understand that he's explained to me that he is going to use additive bonding. He's going to build up the edges of these lateral teeth yet to get the final result. So I can keep telling him I'm a super orthodontist and I know how to bring, bring talk with an aligner, but he's going to say, stop here. Fine, I stop there. But what he does is he takes it to the next level. Minimal, pr minimal preparation, additive bonding, builds these teeth up. The vision is there. He knows where he wants to go. I have to share his vision. So. What you find is a little bit of white filling material goes a long way. It can define a, pa a patient's smile in so many different ways. So this is the LVI smile design chart, and this patient, this is the smile she wanted. She wanted the edges like this at the end. She wanted, it's known as an aggressive start st style. Now, that, does that fit her personality? Actually, it does. This is one of my only patients that took selfies every month and sent them to me to check if treatment was tracking. So hey, it did suit her personality. So we'll move on. When I look at a case, I need to have a workflow in my head of how to approach the case. And I am always looking for a pre-restorative position rather than a final position. So taking that in mind, I have to think of aesthetics, micro, mini, and macro. So we look at the case. With micro, I'm looking at tooth shape. We can look at crown width ratios, um, height width ratios. We can look at the incisal edges. We can look at the gingival architecture and look at the 
gum margins, we can look for symmetry, axial inclinations. With mini we, aesthetics, we put it in context with the low lip, a smile line. We look at the upper lip, and we look at it with tooth exposure, gingival display. So there are so many things that come into account. Some of them we can control, and some of them we have to say we're not superheroes, and someone else has to finish that case off. Taking that on, we, with the macro aesthetics, we have to put it to the skeletal profile, facial midlines, etc. So in this case, this patient's name was Rachel. She was a complete dental phobe, very scared of everything. I've now seen her in a four-year control, and she was, we had to make her a new, new uh, retainer, and it took me 20 minutes to explain to her what an algebraic impression was, again. Because um, they have, some people have a fear. But she came to me because she had heard of Invisalign and heard that we can do something without brackets and wires. So her treatment modality, we were doing something non-extraction, non-invasive. We were aligning the teeth, we were prepping for a pre-restorative position, and in this case, it was just additive bonding on an upper left two. How did I reach this decision when I know there was so much more I wanted to do with this case? Well, we have to give ClinCheck credit, because ClinCheck allows us to look at teeth, look at an end result, talk to the patient, share the vision with the patient of what their needs are, and then afterwards, it may be just small additive bonding, it may be a change in mesial distal width, but your, con your patient can help you consent by going through the process with you, with the ClinCheck. So, I'm searching for a pre-restorative position. <clears throat> Now things get a bit more interesting. So this is uh, Sue. Sue has gone to her dentist and said, I want veneers on all my front teeth. The dentist says, I think you should at least have an orthodontic uh, consult first with Raman. So I see Sue. Now, the dilemma I had here was I had options. She is actually class two on her, on her molars. In slightly increased lower face height, and she has a nice profile, and she quite likes the way she looks. So, do I? Well, I should at least explore the options. Is this a case where I distalize? Is it a case where I take this all to a class one? Sue has good occlusal function, so I, although we talk about teeth and occlusion and class one and class two, she is functioning well right now. So I look at this, and I realize there is a tooth size discrepancy for one. Secondly, I disclosed with the patient that this treatment would require elastics, it will take a certain period of time. Was there another solution? Could I compromise? Well, I thought there may be a compromise. And the compromise is, do I keep my buckle segments where they are, knowing that she is in good occlusal function? And do we use anterior IPR to try to get some type of result in a case like this? The IPR is saying 0.5, 0.5, 0.5 in the anterior teeth. Okay, so I'm still trying to put my pre-restorative hat on. I'm trying to think of this as a pre-restorative case because I know that afterwards she will still need the edges built of these teeth. So the IPR schedule is I will share the 0.5 between the premolar and canine. I will take the whole 0.5 off the canine on the mesial. I will leave the lateral out completely. I will take a full 0.5 of the central and then share again. So I'm trying to omit the lateral incisor to try to improve my tooth size discrepancy. The IPR will be done progressively, which means I will probably do less than what is prescribed. So this is taken straight out of a restorative textbook. And the main values we need to know here is in a ideal situation, if the central is given a value of one, the canine's mesodistal width should be 0.9 of this, and then the lateral is 0.8. We had a situation of 1, 0.9, and 0.6. By playing around with the IPR, as planned, we can take it to 1, 0.9, and 0.7, which means the IPR, we're keeping it in mind to try to improve a tooth size discrepancy. So where does that take me? It gets me to here, which allows me to control my overjet, but also allows me to set the case up for a better restorative finish. And the patient has composite, once again, no veneers, additive bonding, 
and she is happy. So sometimes, as orthodontists, we do compromise, but we should never compromise on function first. And I really had to convince myself that I did the right thing for the patient. So looking at stability planning, the movements were minor, and I hope that, and she has been stable for a long time. Now this is Mark. Mark is the only time I've had a referral from another orthodontist in my life. So I think that's always a worrying time when uh, your local competitor sends you a patient uh, when he's himself an orthodontist. So Mark comes to me looking like this, deep bite, plates or impingement. He's a class one on one side, a class two on the other. And in his functional occlusion, in guidance, he's just wearing away his anterior teeth. There is no canine guidance, no group function. It's all smashing on the anterior teeth. So looking at a case like this, the first thing I'm going to look at is the anterior ratio. And I find that we are missing five millimeters of tooth substance in the lower arch. So this will give me a clue to, pre to look for a pre-restorative position. So it's either I close all the spaces and I lose all arch coordination and I'm not doing the patient a service. I make room for a small central incisor, but at five millimeters, it's more going to be like an acid etched bridge or something in a, in a patient where we know he's already smashing his front teeth. So what we do is we leave the space equidistant between the laterals, one millimeter spaces between the teeth, so he can have minimal prep or minimal composite buildups of these teeth. And that's what we did. We built the teeth up. This restores, first of all, his function. It addresses his aesthetics. And later on, he goes on to have the crowns replaced on the upper teeth as well. So moving on, things can get more complex as well. This is Marianne. So Marianne is only 39 at this time when, we, when I first meet her. She's already seen the periodontist, and I find, I love my periodontist, but I find him as a very pessimistic person. They always talk about everything in uh, complete values like three-year plan, five-year plan, your teeth are gonna go, you need implants. So Marianne really wanted to make these teeth last, so we had to have a joint consult, myself, the periodontist, and the restorative dentist. And we were trying to avoid a situation of implants, especially with uh, such extensive bone loss. So the plan was to set the teeth up, taking the centric relation into account because there was going to be vertical bite opening restoratively. So my job was to work in CR and just align the teeth. The restorative dentist continued the work by placing an anterior rigid splint which opened the bite, rotating the the mandible on the hinge axis, and allowing us to put function back here and splint the teeth. And here we have it. So we want to be able to have light contacts on the anterior teeth. We build in lateral excursions as well and make sure that the patient can function from here. We also need to take care of the vertical in the posterior segments and the teeth were built up slightly as well. This is made so it's easily cleanable although it does look like a good piece of plastic, but it's made with the periodontist views in, considered in as well. And we have her in two-year reviews, and she's stable. Treatments like this, we need to... One thing I can do as an orthodontist is play around with velocity. So normal, if a normal aligner has a movement of 0.25 millimeters per aligner, I can double the number of aligners I have to give me a smaller movement. This way, I can make the patient change every two weeks. If I feel comfortable and confident, I can get it down to one-week changes, but I can see how she's responding, how a biotype is responding, and if I'm comfortable. So we move on, and it was a great lecture yesterday where we heard about move, tooth movements and how they differ in uh, adults um, from different ages and male to female. So, I have Alex here, who is uh, 74 years old. Now, when I see Alex, and her main concern is the upper right one, with localized bone loss, localized gingival attachment missing there, and wear facets, this tooth 
is in occlusal trauma. And we had a lovely lecture earlier on by Dr. Werner, but wouldn't it be nice to have a digital articulator so I could see what happens when I slide the jaw and then see where the first contact is so I can see where the trauma is. That would be great. So in this case, I had to plan my orthodontics once again. It's going to be a pre-restorative position, but to make sure that that tooth could be restored afterwards pr predictably. Another thing is when you're treating a 74-year-old is you have to, don't be afraid to IPR, and you need to protect your arch length. And Alain talked about it yesterday, knowing that we don't want to put teeth outside roots, it's important to try to maintain your actual original arch throughout treatment. So as treatment progresses, we're getting closer to the end, and we have to start thinking about functional and aesthetic needs. I check the patient in lateral excursions, and I can still see that that anterior tooth is involved. So there's nothing that can be placed there that will work. Then I have to remember, she's 74 years old. There is natural wear and tear of her teeth. So I don't need to be a superhero either. So we look at the smile arc. We ask the dentist to add composite to give us some cuspid rise. There may be a slight enamoplasty, and we add a little bit of composite on the edge of the central. So we can see after orthodontics, and then we see after restorative, there is canine guidance, and the tooth is protected. Hey, a mature style for a mature lady. So moving on, this guy here is in charge of human resources for all of Europe for a company called Xerox, the ones that print things. He comes to me with a, with a referral from the dentist saying that everything is failing. Everything is failing in his mouth. They try to replace the crown, it keeps coming off. They try to replace the bridge, it keeps coming off. So once again, it's a functional occlusion problem. So what we did to start with is we tried to restore some function and some aesthetics. I asked the dentist, let's place a three-unit bridge in the right place. In this patient's mouth, I will take care of the rest. He's already looking better. We try to get the midline in a better place too. And now, Invisalign allows us to asymmetrically expand the lower right. It allows us to intrude and close up the diastema. It's a fantastic appliance for having specific treatment objecti objectives. And we get close to a result that we want. And the main thing is we are restoring canine guidance on the right-hand side. And he's happy. ClinCheck is fantastic for, giving us a si for allowing us to work asymmetrically and to give us the symmetry we want on the other side. And we can see here how the lower right quadrant was moved out. And I use cross elastics for three to four aligners only to support that movement. Function is back. It's a functional style that he has. So coming to the last case, making room for implants. And we are in a situation now where things have moved on. You can move teeth bodily. And in a case like this, we made room for an implant. And more than that, we actually, believe it or not, left some mesiodistal spaces in between the laterals and the centrals because the patient's wife said that her husband had too thin teeth. So we were setting the patient up pre-restoratively to keep the wife happy as well. So these laterals on the right side was going to be built up as well. And we get symmetry, and we make room for the implant. So, goals of pre-restorative orthodontics. We want to facilitate the delivery of comprehensive care using an interdisciplinary approach. We want to reduce the need for invasive, destructive dentistry by improving tooth positions. Every case I showed today, there was no prepping for a veneer or a crown. And we want to provide a stable, healthy, and functional occlusion for the restorative dentist to build on. And lastly, you don't need to be a superhero, but part of a super team. Thank you very much.